Photography is changing, we know that. We've done our podcasts on AI, we've seen the software changes, we've seen the huge updates in cameras, but I think things have changed so much that we actually need an entirely new type of camera. We'll talk about what this new segment needs to be and how it could change photography, how it could bring younger people into traditional cameras. Yeah, and we'll also talk about why I think Sony's probably the one that could do it, but I, I do think every manufacturer has a shot. But first, let's talk about Squarespace. Squarespace sponsors our podcast, but they also make beautiful, easy to make websites and portfolios. In fact, I just updated my portfolio today. Mine too. I went in and dragged in my best pictures. I rearranged them so people would see the most compelling photos first. And it, it blows away my Instagram page, which yeah. just has like, oh, my last shot that I took. Yeah. So you'll see like a bunch of Osprey pictures and then whatever project I was working on previously. But I love being able to control the flow, the presentation, the overall feel of the brand that is Northrop Photography. If you want to try out Squarespace, you can do it for free for 14 days. You don't have to put in a credit card and remember to cancel. You're going to want to buy it. Go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea. The coupon code Chelsea will get you 10% off. Thanks, Thanks, Squarespace. First, let's just get into it and talk about the spec war that's been going on in the camera industry forever. Yeah, it's really like they've been fighting the same fight since the 50s. Like resolution, megapixels, frames, frames per, per second, second uh, dynamic range, all of those things. And I'm so glad for those advancements. In 2008, I remember I had the Canon 5D Mark II. I still have pictures in my portfolio from that maybe. Yeah, me too. It was a good camera. It was like 21 megapixels, but it was four frames per second. You could still get pro pictures with it. It was great. But by 2020, Canon came out with the R5 and it's 45 megapixels and 20 frames per second. It'll spot the eye of a butterfly that's yes. flapping past you. And what's the R8 have now? Like 40 frames per second or right. something? Yep. The frame rate, the megapixels, the resolution, autofocus. You got it, guys. You did it. No. Let's move on to something. No, 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 no. I like it. It works for me. As someone who's photographing like Osprey diving into the water, I want a super high frame rate frames per second. I want the best autofocus. That's not everybody. Yeah. And by the way, that's not going to go away. No. That's why we're suggesting a new segment. This because isn't going they will definitely continue down this same path. Yes. Of making traditional cameras. So we want something different, something newer that can bring new people into the industry. But let's talk about how this changed. I mean, you saw how the Mark II changed from the R5, but smartphones have really been eating into camera sales. And you can see why, because in 2008, the most popular cell phone in the United States was the Motorola Razr. I had it and loved it. I still have it in my closet, by the way, but look at the pictures that came out of this thing. Garbage. They're not good. I mean, it was novel. It seemed cool at the time, but it wasn't replacing cameras. We had things like the Nikon Cool Pick and you would, you know, sometimes use your smartphone to maybe text a photo to somebody, but it wasn't like photography. Uh, so you would buy something like the Coolpix that was a couple hundred dollars. You weren't spending thousands of dollars on something like the 5D Mark II, but you were still getting pretty decent pictures. But now smartphones are closing the gap. And I'll add the way we consume pictures has changed. We no longer need high quality because in 2008, most of us were consuming pictures on like 30 inch monitors. Yeah. And nowadays everything is done with your phone held vertically like this. Yeah, even most of our videos are watched on phones. And the most common video resolution is for watching it is 720p. Even if you record in 8K, people are watching it in 720. And so all those megapixels don't end up mattering to the vast majority of people consuming it. But now in like 2020, this is like from my iPhone in 2019, maybe it was the iPhone 13. You can see how this is competing with that cool pics market, right? We had the situation where camera manufacturers were making a ton of money from point and shoots like the cool pics, which was actually like Nikon's biggest camera for a while. And then we had smartphones come in and just eat up that market. So there's this hole in the market and they're trying to make up for it in different ways. We've seen that Canon is now limiting third-party lenses. They need to make money, right? And we're seeing that they're putting a lot of their R&D into the really high-level cameras. The prices of those and the lenses are all going up. You have Canon artificially limiting some of their cameras that they're not cannibalizing different markets. So remember the R5 video was overheating and we all discovered it was like software. It was, it was by design. It's because they didn't want to cannibalize the sales of their, their video cameras. So we're seeing that they're having to figure out new ways to make money now that this market is 
being eaten up by cell phones. And you can see on this graph, point and shoot cameras were huge in like 2009, 2010, and then it just shrunk right up. And if I look at 2001, I can actually see it's been increasing Shh. for the last couple we're of years. We're getting there. Okay. <laughs> we're getting there. The so software and AI has been able to defy physics. And what I mean by that is that it used to be that not having a huge lens could limit the quality of your photos because like that's just how physics work. You often just need big glass and then you have smartphone cameras like the new Samsung that has the 200 millimeter zoom. Mm -hmm. And we all discovered that they were using AI to kind of composite moon photos to make them look more high res than they actually are. And these trends are going to continue and that's going to continue to offset the consumer camera market, which is why we need a new category of consumer camera. So where do we go now? Because we definitely still have this spec war going on with all the manufacturers. There is this hole where the cool pics and the other point and shoots used to be. We still have point and shoot cameras, but people aren't really latching onto them. And it's because they want a different experience. People still love photography. It's more popular than it ever was. It's just I think that the cameras that they're developing now are not filling that need. And if you look at another trend on Google Trends, I put in film photography, you can see that film was higher in like 2004 when the digital camera wasn't super, super popular and then dipped until about 2017 and now it's doubled. The searches have doubled for film cameras. I think why that is is because though the point and shoot market is drying up, people still want the experience. They're not just looking for the resolution and you know the outcome of their photos. They're looking to engage with their camera in a way that's fun. So Tony, I went on Amazon and I started looking up what people are actually buying when they go on there to buy cameras and one of the top cameras was this thing. I don't even think it has a brand. Let me read it to you. 4K digital camera with viewfinder flash and dial. 48 megapixels. Really? A vlogging camera for photography and video autofocus anti-shake. Travel portable digital camera with SD card, two batteries, 16 times zoom fashion camera. I'm so sorry you had to hear me say that. Oh, it's the best camera that Bevezer makes. But I think why people are buying this is because it's attractive. It's cute. I think that's the only reason. And the other things I saw people buying were Instax cameras, very trendy right now. And it's because people want something real and they want an experience. So what do people actually want? We dug in a little bit. We found out what people are trying to buy and what the big camera manufacturers are missing out on. And we're gonna go into that. But first, let's talk about our sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace makes websites for you. Websites that you control, that aren't controlled by social media. Chelsea and I both have our photography and video portfolios hosted by Squarespace. We just drag our pictures in, choose a template, choose fonts, colors that match your personal style, or just go with something that's been designed by the Squarespace designers. It makes you look far more professional than just giving out your social media. You can get your own domain name, like I'm NorthropPhotography.com, you're ChelseaNorthrop.com, and your own email addresses. And that's a good way to build your business and build a brand. Get started today at Squarespace.com slash Chelsea. It's a totally free trial. So set it up. And if you like it, which you will, the coupon code Chelsea will get you 10% off. Thanks, Squarespace. So what do people want, Tony? When I look into the cameras that people are buying, I have found that what they want is the experience because it's really easy to get pretty good results from your phone. Mm -hmm. It's pretty easy to, you know, get good results from an old DSLR. That's not cool. They want something that is fun and stylish. So I put in this film graph before and you could see that film dipped and then went up in popularity. Well, the little red line underneath it is the Fujifilm X100V, which is like this viral popular camera. I just made a whole video on alternatives because it's sold out everywhere. Like it's not super special, except that it's like attractive yeah. and was pretty decently priced and was fun to use. Yeah, it's no longer decently priced though because it's so in yeah. demand. So what people want is a fun camera, a camera that has style, which I think is a really overlooked thing, and a camera that's relatively easy. So let's dig into what those three points mean. Well, first let's talk about what it means for a camera to be fun. For the longest time, I feel like cameras have been like tools. Yeah. They were functional, but yeah. not fun. If you look at the X100V, it has nice analog dials. And when you click them, when you turn them, you get nice, satisfying clicks. Yeah, and I think that people overlook the fun factor and the tactile experience, but think about 
like your favorite pen that you reach for. You can have five on your desk, but you grab the one where it has the satisfying click when you open it and then it's smooth. And it would seem silly to explain to someone like, it just writes a little smoother. I like how it feels, but you keep going back to it. And that's what camera manufacturers often miss is that fun factor, that tactile experience. A lot of the cameras feel more like that pen at the bank that has the chain on it where you have to like grab an old receipt and like squiggle it a bunch to get oh, the ink to it come like out. It makes my teeth hurt for oh. some reason when you talk <laughs> about that. Yeah, there is something to the tactile experience because we all know that. Think about when you like bite into the perfect steamed bun and it's squishy or when you go to close a drawer and it's one of those soft closed drawers and it's so satisfying you want to do it again. The way things feel matter. We are tactile beings. We have like four trillion nerves in our bodies. Do not overlook that camera manufacturers. Humans like touching and feeling things. Sony's starting to understand this. They're starting to make lenses with aperture rings on them and mm -hmm. that does add to the experience but they do have a long way to go to close the gap between them and that X100V. And they have an even longer way to go if you talk about style. Every, pretty much every camera made nowadays looks almost identical to the cameras made for tourists in the 1980s. If we're going out to dinner and I want to take some pictures, if I bring the most functional camera I have, the Sony Alpha 1, you know what the wait staff will say to me? They'll say, where are you guys visiting from? Where are you from? Because I look like a tourist. Okay. But if I were to bring my X-Pro, my X-T3, they would say, oh, are you guys photographers? People have literally said that. And when I bring my X100V out, that's kind of my around town camera. People stop me to talk about it. They'll be like, oh, your camera's cute. Or is that film? Or, oh, I had a camera like that. They like the way it looks. And I don't need people sparking conversation with me, but it's nice that it's an attractive camera. So why are we neglecting the style? I think Leica often has good style. I like when they do their limited edition cameras with like different leathers and different skins and they have like the beautiful uh, chrome and metal on their cameras, but they're like thousands of dollars or like $10,000 sometimes and that's just not accessible. I think Fuji really has this figured out, but the thing with Fuji is that I don't think that they have the next point, which is the ease of use. Ultimately, the high tech of the latest mirrorless cameras is useful for professionals, but especially useful for beginners which yeah. everybody buying the first camera is going to be. And they need it to be easy. They need the camera to find the eye of the subject and focus on it without them having to worry about selecting AFC or AFS or moving the focusing point around or any of that because that's what their smartphone does. That's what we expect from it. Sony and Canon are more there than Fuji is, I think. Yeah, and I think that actually like goes into the first point of it being fun because once something is frustrating, it is no longer fun. And if a person just wants a camera to have fun and to walk around, if the market is that point and shoot market that used to exist, we can't have it being frustrating. And I know that as photo nerds like me and Tony and perhaps you watching, you're like, they have to learn, read the manual, like learn what these things are. No, that's not the market. We need these people who don't want to delve into all the nerdy stuff to buy cameras and give our manufacturers money so that we can get our top level cameras. So let people just have their fun, simple cameras that are easy. I, I um, texted our niece a picture of three cameras and said, which camera would you rather use and carry around? And she just goes first one and it's the X100V. The other two are the Nikon ZFC and the Fuji X-T3. You didn't even include like a Sony a6400 in there? Well, no, it wasn't a contender because no. nobody ever would have wanted just a solid black camera that looked like an 80s well, camera. The, the, the A7C is close. They've got that chrome top. It's better looking. It's better, but still it's, it's not there. It's not quite there. They're just missing something. So let's talk about easy, which is the next point. This one makes people mad because for some reason, a big segment of our community does not want photography to be accessible to people. But you and I disagree. We want anybody to be able to pick up a camera and take great pictures. And I think the world's a better place if everybody gets a chance to share how they see the world. It should not be overly complex. That's been our goal as teachers for forever is to make photography as easy and accessible as possible. But cameras are neither of those things. The Sony Alpha menu system has about 900 nodes on it and there is no search feature. So how do you find the one that you need? Many of them are cryptically named. And the manuals, people say read the manual, the manual is a thousand pages long. And I guarantee almost nobody has actually read it because nobody reads a thousand page technical manual. Why did you say that? I know this person's going to be in our comments now. 
<laughs> no, but it's a lot. It's a lot to ask. So some of you will. Yeah. Good for you. You will read it. You will process it. Yeah. You will understand it. But you are in a tiny minority, and photography should be accessible to a broader range of people. Very few people read manuals for anything. What was the last user manual you read? Our car. Not the whole thing, but and you, you skimmed over a I'll few skim. pieces of it. Okay, but you can't skim the manual for a Sony Alpha One. You really have to understand the different features. This is the thing that I appreciate about photography, but also that I think makes it challenging for a beginner is that it's so steeped in tradition and history that a lot of the terms and methods go back like a hundred years. And then you try to get some 20 year old kid into it. Like I wanted to buy our niece Maya a camera, but I'm like, why does she have to deal with all this stuff? Why can't it just be like her phone where it's easy and she can have fun? I don't think you have to be a technical person to enjoy photography. So why make this artificial barrier to entry that keeps people from buying and enjoying cameras? We need a fresh start with yeah. a fresh menu system, a fresh control scheme. I really like what the Hasselblad X2D 100C did. It has 10 icons on the menu. Yeah. DJI does a really good job with their menu systems, but all the other big manufacturers, they've completely failed people with overly complicated, difficult to understand menu systems. Something else that ruins the ease of use is transferring images. The last step after you take a picture is to get it somewhere to share. And even when somebody has uh, an X100V, most of the time when they see them share pictures, they physically pick up the camera and they scroll through their pictures and show people the back of the camera well, because so it's difficult to get the pictures off. I used to just use the app and I would just use the JPEGs with the built-in photo presets that they have there. And I really liked that process. And the last time I went to use it, I don't know if there was an update or if there wasn't an update, but it just wouldn't work. This happens a lot. My Canon app just stopped working and I could not get it to work. It was frustrating. So I can't imagine somebody that doesn't do this all of the time trying to deal with that. So that process has to be easier. So I tested the app on two cameras recently, the brand new Sony ZV-E10. They have a brand new creator app. They yeah. hyped all the features. I spent 45 minutes and I could not get it to connect. Yeah, but what about the Canon R8 when you tried to transfer a file? I, I had to do a manual override on the Canon R8 to get it to set up. The instructions did not work, but I figured it out. I hacked it together because I'm a nerd and I know how to do that stuff. I transferred a three second video from my phone to my computer, and it took three seconds to transfer. This is a 4K60 video. I transferred that same file from my camera to my phone wirelessly. It took seven minutes and eight seconds for a three second video file. Yeah. Totally unacceptable. I mean, there's that, more. There's more. Canon has a cloud service, just like oh, yeah. Apple's cloud service, which automatically transfers your pictures in the background, gives you a live backup. Canon can do that with image.canon. I started that, I spent 20 minutes setting it up. I started the camera syncing. I waited 22 minutes while it transferred the first image. It did not finish transferring one picture and then it crashed after 22 minutes. And I am a very technically capable nerd and I could not get these two cameras to work in an acceptable way. So what is somebody who's young, who didn't grow up reading or writing huge technical manuals, what are they supposed to do? Well, they give up. They go back to their smartphone. Well, that's the thing. I've gotten people to buy cameras. They'll ask me, what should I buy? And they listen to me and then they stop using the camera because like they get frustrated with getting the photos onto a computer or onto their phone or dealing with the files or trying to figure out different settings or you know what else happens? Like little things happen, like their diopter gets flipped and then they think their camera's broken. They think something breaks, but it's just a setting that accidentally got hit. And that's so frustrating that it makes it not fun. It makes it frustrating. So I think that this perfect camera is going to be something that is attractive first and foremost. As vain as that's going to sound to some of you, it has to be good looking. It has to be fun, which means that it's not frustrating. It's simple and it has a modern process to taking photos that young people are going to relate to. It's got to be easy. I specifically named this podcast Dear Sony because I have seen with them that they're unafraid to try new things. And I think they already have all of the technology, which I think is the difficult part. Like the guts of the camera, take an A7 III and put that in an attractive body. I think they have to do a little more. I think they need software, a fresh start. Yeah. They need to start from scratch. And that's Japanese companies in general their approach is always to take something that works 
and then just refine it and refine it and refine it. And that's why Toyotas are so reliable. And that's why all of our cameras are so reliable. We need to start with the guts of a smartphone. And <laughs> Sony's the only company with smartphones. Yeah. And build up a camera built around connectivity, built around ease of use, but then add in those gorgeous optics that really make those beautiful images. I think Fuji is also very close because they have the body, the dials, the looks everybody wants, but they really fall apart like the app. They just have not updated that. And yeah, then, but I don't think they're ever going to get there by just trying to fix their app. No, but because they need an entire new process. They need a new yeah. operating system on the cameras. The way they've built everything up to this point is not going to scale into the future. And there are technical limitations that are going to prevent it from keeping up with every iPhone update, every new type of wireless access point that they need to connect to. Nikon was really close with the ZFC. I like that camera. I thought that was pretty fun. But there was just something missing to it. Again, the experience just wasn't quite right on the software side. Yeah. So I feel like all of these companies are close. They could have the camera. They just need to tune into what younger people want right now. I'm curious what you all think about this. If one of these manufacturers makes this camera, I would buy five. I would buy one for Maya. I would buy one for Madeline. I'd buy one for everyone. Here's something that's fun and professional and easy to use. Squarespace. Go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea and pick a template that matches your personal style. Now you can drag your photos in, drag your videos in, tell the world about yourself. And you have a professional website that represents your brand. You can take appointments from clients, you can accept deposits, you could sell prints online. It's not just photography. It could be any business, any personal project. The best place for all of this is squarespace.com slash Chelsea. And best of all, you can try it out completely free. There's no risk. So try it out, and if you love it, the coupon code CHELSEA, C-H-E-L-S-E-A, will get you 10% off. Thank you, Squarespace. And thanks to all of you. If you want to see more of our picture of this podcast, you can subscribe to the playlist so that you always see the new ones, or you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, or just get it anywhere podcasts are available. Thanks so much. Bye.